On this episode, we see how Salem, Oregon has improved pedestrian facilities next to a railroad. In Columbia, South Carolina, a new pedestrian bridge reunites a community divided by a highway. Rockville, Maryland uses new tools to analyze the pedestrian environment. We drop in on the third New Partners for Smart Growth conference in Portland, Oregon. Finally, we talk with a local resident about pedestrians in South Nyack, New York. Stay tuned. We're in Salem, Oregon, talking with Rick Barnes, who's a project engineer with the city. What's behind us here? What we have is the 12th Street Pedestrian Safety Promenade. It's a project where we've taken an area that had an existing frontage road and we've made it into a 14 foot wide walkway that is a joint use pedestrian and vehicle way running along a set of active railroad lines here in Salem. What was here before that pedestrians would be uh, faced with? Here initially we had a uh, 14 foot wide just an asphalt roadway with a five foot sidewalk and it was just your average frontage road, nothing uh, special, one-way frontage road. And what we did is we took that out and combined both the pedestrian and the vehicle way into a concrete walkway with landscaping and, a, and also a vertical uh, barrier wall in between the roadway and the, the rail, rail lines. And the barrier between the walkway and the rail lines what, uh, how tall does that have to be? What does it have to be to, to do its job? It's approximately four and a half feet high, and it's, it's kind of at a me medium height uh, fence option. We looked at ones that would be six feet high, and we looked at small ones two and a half feet high. And this was kind of a medium size height fence that would prevent people from scaling it it's not physically impossible, but it's, it's preventing people from, from trespassing across the railroad tracks easily like we, they had been doing in the past. So this is kind of a, a uh, vertical feature that, that provides enough of a barrier that pedestrians who are walking down through here feel comforted knowing that there is something in between them and the railroad tracks. And you say it's a shared space for, for vehicles and pedestrians. How's that been working out? It's actually been working out very well. The, the pedestrians seem to uh, part if a vehicle comes through, and the vehicles, being as this is a concrete walkway, it looks like a big wide sidewalk, and so the vehicles are already feeling uncomfortable to be up here, and so they're going at a very slow speed as well. So it, it works out really well for both of them. And eventually, where might this be extended to? What we have done so far is about three quarters of the project and it will link uh, the railroad station on the south to actually to the high school on the north end. There will be a pedestrian bridge on the north end so it will provide an, a link for approximately nine blocks from, from the high school all the way down. We're in Columbia, South Carolina, talking with Tom Dodds, who's the pedestrian and bicycle coordinator with the South Carolina Department of Transportation. What does a ped bike coordinator do? Well, the state pedestrian and bike coordinator pretty much has free reign to go and do everything as reasonably possible to help those modes of transportation, the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and others that are using non-motorized transportation on our, on our roadway system in South Carolina. What's this bridge behind us? bridge behind us is the James Clyburn pedestrian overpass. It passes over uh, a freeway that uh, accesses the city of Columbia, our capital, Route 277. And it is, serves to unite neighborhoods that had been separated when the freeway was originally put in decades ago. Um, there, were a lot of, there was a lot of cut through traffic, people uh, taking their life in their hands crossing the uh, alignment of 277, even though we had uh, in later years put a chain link fence down the, the center of the median. But that wasn't what was needed. What was needed was a way to allow people on foot to gain access back and forth between the communities that were, that were severed. And this does a marvelous job of that. And uh, a lot of interstate highways, a lot of neighborhoods that got separated. Uh, 
what, what goes into figuring out where you need to put in a, a pedestrian bridge and, and where other bridges might do the trick? Well, uh, a pedestrian bridge and such as this, why, you know, the question may be why we didn't put in a conventional bridge that would allow motorist traffic as well. Uh, the considerations are that the, many times the, the neighborhoods involved, the communities involved, don't need that much additional traffic added to them, motorist traffic, and yet they still need a means by which uh, folks on foot, kids coming from school, uh, parents, you know, picking them up, people going on shopping trips can still get back and forth to the destinations they need to access. And that's why we, we established a pedestrian bridge. Why it was here, it took advantage of the topography, the fact that this is a cut section uh, on one side for the 277 freeway. On the other side, there's not quite so much a ramp up or steps up to the facility. And, uh, and on here, it's not too bad on this side. So, so we, we tried to get at a place where we took advantage of the natural topography as well as a place that was convenient to the communities we were trying to help. And places where you put in pedestrian bridges, uh, what sort of feedback do you get from the community? Do they like them? They do. Uh, they generally, they were very positive about this bridge in particular. I think that it probably got as many uh, accolades from the community as any pedestrian overpass we've ever put in in South Carolina, simply because of the of the design care that was taken and the aesthetics that were were very crucial to the Department of Transportation in, in uh, making sure this was something that would not only join the community back together, but enhance it and, and be uh, a beautiful architectural feature for the, for the community, as well as the site where we have added our uh, state tree, the palm, palmetto tree, and many other uh, features of beautification. We're in Rockville, Maryland, talking with Larry Marcus, who's chief of the Traffic and Transportation Division. Traditionally, how have engineers looked at intersections? Traditionally, it's been based on the geometry of the intersection, and it's been based on the, the number of cars that are going through the intersection and conflicting movements of cars. And if you're trying to give a, some kind of grade or score to an intersection, uh, what were your measuring tools? That's it. It would be based on um, traffic counting and then looking at conflicting car movements to determine the capacity of an intersection. And then you would uh, design your signal timing based on moving as many cars as possible. And if you wanted to look at an intersection from the standpoint of pedestrians, what's been available? Limited, if, if any, type of uh, way to quantify it. There have been many good ideas on how to make improvements, but not on ways to say, okay, is that good enough? So what have you been able to do here in Rockville? Yeah, well, we started with our uh, master planning process and looking at uh, pedestrian-oriented goals and objectives, but we had no way to measure the goals and objectives to see if we're achieving our goals. So what we did is we came up with a pedestrian rating system of safety, and it starts with uh, poor and goes all the way to excellent. What are the different elements that go into rating an intersection for pedestrians? Yeah, there's several, and in our case, we keep it to infrastructure because that's something that we can... We can mandate on developers as well as put into our own budget to fix and thus rate the quality of it. So they're any, anywhere from the basics of striping of crosswalks and adequate signal timing and uh, pedestrian heads, walk don't walk signs. And then it steps up to uh, pedestrian refuges, uh, turn restrictions, right turn on red specifically to make it safer for pedestrians. In some cases we have uh, what's called a pedestrian advance where it's an odd red for four or five seconds to let the pedestrian walk out first and, and uh, be visible. Uh, and then it gets to the higher end stuff such as um, the paddle signs or unique treatments, countdown pedestrian signals for example. So that's kind of the range of it and that goes from poor where it's inadequate to acceptable to outstanding or excellent. And looking at those criteria, how would this intersection behind us compare to the one uh, a little over a block away down near the metro station? Yes, this one would be an excellent intersection because uh, there's uh, ample time for people to cross the street, number one most important thing. Uh, the crosswalks are well marked, in some cases highlighted, with uh, either a vertical sign or extra pavement markings. And then uh, finally have a countdown pedestrian heads, which is, is uh, about as much as we can do. 
but uh, intersection uh, around the corner from us, which actually has higher volume, uh, unfortunately one we don't control, uh, has the basics, meaning that it has cross, uh, crosswalks that are generally crossed, barely enough time to cross the street, and, and basic traffic infrastructure. So uh, we're working with other jurisdictions to improve that intersection. Have you been able to rate all the intersections in the city? We have, all the signalized intersections, yes. What'd you find? <laughs> uh, fortunately, we're just above the adequate raining, uh, which means that uh, things are okay, but we could, do, we could do better. And we're looking forward to doing that. And with the rating system, we can start to target where to allocate our money and where to ca allocate uh, others' money. Yeah. And traditionally, when you brought a developer uh, developing a site in the city, they've done a traffic analysis nearby do you have anything similar for their impact on pedestrians? No, it was very uh, spot-based. Uh, as we said, that what's, what's traditional for uh, development to come in to do is what's called a standard traffic study, a traffic impact analysis, which is great for understanding the impacts of cars, but it, it doesn't get to the, the full approach. What we've been doing is uh, trying to expand that, and we actually have a draft of it complete now called a comprehensive transportation review that all developers will be required to go through. And that uh, looks at automobile movement, as well as uh, pedestrians, bicycles, and transit facilities. When you try to map the city to show walking distance from destinations, how do you measure that? Yeah, it's, it, it's a technical tool that enables us to look at travel time to a key activity center, such as a school, a metro station, a shopping center. And uh, the way that we do it is we actually have, similar to what's been done for a long time for cars, we actually have a network for, the si for people walking, sidewalks, uh, crossings of streets um, and delays at intersections and so through all of that we go through and actually um, simulate the travel time based based on all of those those elements and and the product are uh, travel time rings or isochromes that show in whatever increment we wish usually 5 10 and 15 minute walk time uh, to these key activity centers and, and what sort of things can make the you know, shrink your five minute walk area to a lot less than the theoretical maximum. <laughs> yeah, the, the value of, of doing that whole exercise is enables us to see the strengths and weaknesses of a system. And where we don't have perfect circles or diamonds, what uh, we can find is where there are missing links, uh, excessive delays at intersections, uh, or just inadequacies in the pedestrian network that uh, we have we have put time delays in for to try to pick those things up, uh, things that uh, we think we can improve. Now, when you look at transit access, your five minute walk to the bus stop, what does this sort of analysis reveal that just a circle drawn on a map not show? Yeah, it's, it's very important for us to, to try to make all of our city, Rockville, uh, accessible to people to, to walk to transit, not have to get in the car. And so what the analysis uh, enables us to see is, is, is we're applying the same pedestrian model to, to the bus stops. And then the ability to, to get to these bus stops reasonably. If you just look on a map, you don't pick up things, uh, physical barriers, uh, the type of constraints that, that a normal pe person would have to walk around through a park, et cetera, the safety factors that are, that are unacceptable. So this enables us to track specifically the access of bus stops. What sort of difference will it make for the people who live in Rockville or work in Rockville when you manage to make the sort of pedestrian improvements that you're doing? Yeah, and that's, that's a good question. We, we are really out of highway options, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we, we the city as the community as a whole, want to be more walkable. I mean, that's one of the main uh, objectives of our mayor and council is to become a pedestrian-oriented community. So we have a lot of support to, to move forward to, to become that. We're in Portland, Oregon, talking with Jake McKenzie, who's a council member with the city of Ronit Park, California. 
What's been going on here the last few days? <laughs> well, first of all, we've had a terrifically successful conference. Over 900 people, uh, 200 people more than we had at our second annual conference last year in New Orleans. And this year's third annual conference, New Partners for Smart Growth, uh, sponsored by US EPA, has been a roaring success. A um, couple of things that really stood out, in my opinion, um, the emphasis on the road to smart growth, transportation issues. We heard from Congressman Blumenar from the 3rd District here in Oregon. Uh, we heard from other speakers in workshops on the critical need for funding for our transportation systems. If we don't get working transportation systems in place that combine the various modes of transportation, the buses, the trains, pedestrians, bikes, along with our highway systems, we're not going to be able to make smart growth work. We're not going to be able to avoid uh, the consequences and the expenses of sprawl development where the automobile rules where energy uh, utilization goes up, where air pollution increases, where our, you know, our total reliance or almost total reliance on foreign sources of oil uh, is going to start to be a huge security problem as well as potentially a, or an increasing environmental problem in this country. So that congressional action that will be taking place over the next number of months, we hope, is going to be critical to all of us in all of our states. So that was a theme. And then wrapping up today, uh, Terry Tamanen, the new California EPA uh, secretary under Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, gave us a pretty inspired speech and I think took a lot of people maybe by surprise when he talked about the five principles that the Schwarzenegger administration is going to be following to make sure that growth in California is smart. And his point was that it better be smart because the 35 million Californians of today are going to be the 50 million Californians of the year 2025, that we have a brewing energy crisis, very particularly in California. And so he wanted to emphasize to us that these five principles, first of all, local governments have got to be encouraged to practice smart growth, to implement it in their general plans, and that the state administration, the Schwarzenegger administration, is going to look at both the carrot approach and the stick approach, you know, both ways to encourage this, but also to make sure that there, if necessary, are penalties if uh, local governments are uh, recalcitrant, if you will. Uh, preservation of natural resources and following on with initiatives from the Davis administration. I think this was very encouraging to hear that California's legacy program under former Secretary of Resources Nichols is going to be continued under the Schwarzenegger administration and identify these valuable resource sources, these resource lands, and make sure that local governments are aware of what these resource lands are to protect. You have three more things that he emphasized. You had this whole idea of smart investments. Scarce resources in California these days, as everybody knows. Huge budget crisis is upon us and still has to be dealt with. But where state monies are going to be invested, they should be invested smartly. So you've got that aspect. Uh, he left public education to the last as the uh, probably the most important um, of all of these uh, policy uh, initiatives, these things to be emphasized, and that is that the people of California, the citizens, uh, need to be convinced and need to be educated in the benefits to them of conservation. And in fact, the, the secretary ended up uh, quoting um, a couple of times from John F. Kennedy uh, and what can you do for your, you know, ask not, you know, what you can do for yourselves, basically, but what can you do for your country, what can you do for your state, and at the same time reminding us that, you know, we're all passengers in this planet. And so I think that, um, you know, looking back at that, wrapping up that keynote speech at the end of the conference really, uh, for us Californians anyway, uh, was a terrific message. And maybe a bit surprising, but on the other hand, 
to have the new Cal EPA secretary standing up in a uh, major public meeting um, in a state to the north with m many hundreds of Californians in the audience and, and laying out these principles um, that are going to uh, govern a lot of what he and his colleagues do in the Schwarzenegger administration is very encouraging. And one of his points was the importance of public education. What role does a, a meeting like this play in, in that public education? Well, we've been at the vanguard uh, in the local government commission here and with our partners with EPA and our partners with Penn State and all of the uh, practitioners from both the private and the public sector in laying out and making available to more and more people, and this is what was so encouraging about the increased registration, getting city managers, getting uh, people who are on planning commissions and in individual communities and gradually getting the word out that, you know, where smart growth used to be thought of as kind of a kooky sort of left wing, if you will, and it was often characterized that way, left wing type of um, notion. Uh, it's now been seen as the way in which communities need to develop, where we need to be aware of the resources that we're consuming, the resources that sprawl, suburban sprawl eats up, the need to preserve open space and farmland, uh, the need to look at sensible transportation systems, trying to get people working and living in the uh, in the same community, cutting down on the number of commute hours that they spend in an automobile or making it possible for them to get on a smart bus or a rapid train system and and move around without adding to you know the number of vehicles miles traveled the number of gallons of gasoline consumed the increasing problem with air pollution so um, getting all of these messages out to the public then needs to happen at the local level and I think programs such as this uh, are one of the means where we need to uh, not just back in Maryland, but in all other states. We need to be getting this word out so that people start to realize that their individual habits are part of the problem. And frankly, uh, Secretary Tamanen said that there needs to be some sacrifice. And this, of course, you know, if you go back to the era of Jimmy Carter's infamous speech on, uh, uh, on, on gasoline and uh, petroleum resources and, and the heating fuel oil crisis, uh, uh, was it 79 or 78, I can't remember. But, and maybe sacrifice isn't a popular word, but I think if people realize these crises that are uh, upon us, um, I think this is part of part of what we need to do we need to get this message out we're in South Nyack New York talking with Jen Benepe what's it like for pedestrians in the Nyacks well you know it's good and it's bad I mean there are some drivers who respect pedestrians and they stop at crosswalks but I would say that at least more than 50 percent ignore pedestrians in the crosswalk before the, the latest law was applied, or passed rather, and after as well. What, uh, what sort of enforcement uh, are the cities able to do? I have never ever seen a cop give anyone a ticket for going straight through a crosswalk when a pedestrian is waiting to cross. I've never seen anything. Um, and there's more, there's, there's more to that as well. I mean, I've, I've talked to people in the administration and I've told them that the cars don't stop and they said yes we know and I said well what are you going to do about that and they said well we don't have enough law enforcement to enforce the traffic laws that might be true so they really do need to be working on another alternative in that case and the intersection behind us leads from the neighborhood to the playground uh, what's it like for children to cross well um, it's completely unregulated. There's no, uh, there's nothing painted on the on the actual crossing. There are no signs, so no car. E even if the cars, you know, would stop, which I kind of doubt that they would, if they saw a pedestrian in a painted crosswalk. Now they have absolutely no obligation 
to stop for a child or anybody else. So if someone gets hit here, um, there's no criminality, there's no prosecution, there's no basis for prosecution. Um, so I see children five years old skipping across the roadway to the park, la 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 la, and I also see cars traveling at anywhere from 40 to 70 miles an hour between that stop sign there to the other stop sign in the other direction. This road leads from 9W, which is a major arterial route, and also from the highway. You have all kinds of people driving down this road, people who do not care about the community, who don't live in the community. Um, I've seen New Jersey license plates, and I've also heard, both from the administration in the town and from other people, that there is an active drug trade, so they may be coming in for the drug trade. And they might, they might not even be, you know, Clair, you know, they may not be clear. They may not be in driving condition. They might be stoned. So I find it really disturbing, and I know that um, children have been killed in other areas that are much less traveled in Nyack, and they put in speed bumps. This road not only needs a crossing, a formal crossing, but it also needs a speed bump. What else needs to happen to make things safer for pedestrians here? Well, I don't know. I think... Um, Unfortunately, the, it's either the time we're in or the, the mentality, but we have a very car-oriented mentality in, in this whole country as a whole, and, and I find it very frustrating. Um, people who, who see that understand exactly what's going on. People who don't see that don't understand what's going on. And I think, you know, they've, there's been a real effort to make cars safer for people inside cars. And there has not been an, a real effort to make people safer outside cars. For example, how come they've never designed a protective device that opens up outside of a car when it comes in contact with someone? Does, did it ever occur to anyone that there should be a, a big, you know, soft, soft thing that comes out of a car on contact so that the person doesn't get killed? I just find it astounding, and I also find it astounding that they're building cars that are faster and harder and heavier than ever before, which means that they're bigger killers than ever before. They'll, they'll kill someone in an instant instead of in, you know, an hour, you know. So I just feel like the, the whole environment is really difficult in the entire country. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.